A secret recording shuts down the career of Texas House Speaker Dennis Bonin. Once you forget that your constituency is that 149 voters, those dogs will eat you alive. We're looking closer at how his support evaporated and what's next for one of the most powerful positions in Texas. New calls to improve elections in Texas. We'll look closer at ideas to bring more voters to the polls and get new candidates on your ballot. For eight or nine months, I I've been looking for the proper off-ramp so that I could go back home. Rick Perry is leaving the White House. What he's saying about his reasons for leaving amid the impeachment inquiry. Hello and thank you for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. It took Representative Dennis Bonin more than 20 years to become Speaker of the Texas House. It took him four months to lose the job. Bonin's downfall started in June after a meeting with Michael Quinn Sullivan, the leader of the conservative group Empower Texans. We've told you how Sullivan recorded that meeting. The recording revealed Bonin offering a House floor access to Sullivan's group in exchange for campaign work. That drew the attention of investigators who looked into whether Bonin should face criminal charges. The answer, no. On Thursday, the Brazoria County District Attorney said Bonin's actions were offensive and lacking in integrity, but not against the law. Bonin's spokesperson released a statement calling Sullivan's recording and the investigation unfortunate and that it ended with the defamation of Bonin's quarter century in public service. The statement said, while justice prevailed, unfortunately, the damage has been done. But the investigation had little to do with the big damage Bonin faced from the recording. After the session, Bonin vowed not to campaign against fellow Republicans, but the recording captured him talking about how he was doing just that. The recording let people hear Bonin insulting leaders of counties and cities, and it revealed crude and hurtful things he said about individual House members. Sullivan released the recording last week, days before a House Republican caucus meeting. As more people actually heard the recording, more of Bonin's supporters started to turn away from him. On Monday, he made his announcement saying it was clear that he can no longer seek re-election as state representative of District 25 and subsequently as Speaker of the House. Many House members joined the call for Bonin to resign just in the past few days. Others made that call weeks ago. Joining us for perspective is State Representative Kyle Biederman, a Republican from Fredericksburg. Now, you were among the first House members to call for Bonin to resign. Why did you decide to make that early action? Well, as soon as I heard about the tape and the, and the uh, ability to go listen to the tape, I, I drove to Austin immediately because it was, it's important. Our, we need to know exactly what happened. And especially when we got emails first from our speaker directly to the House members denying any wrongdoing or denying any of the things that were really on the tape, uh, it was important to find out for sure. So when I went, heard the tape, uh, it was quite obvious uh, what had happened. Yeah, when you heard the tape, I mean, did anything surprise you? I mean, there was surely something there that kind of was not what you were expecting. Well, um, you know, I was just in session the whole time with uh, Speaker Bonin. Um, I would never have thought those things. Uh, I know Speaker Bonin uh, speaks his mind, and of course he said a lot of those things that he's, uh, uh, you know, the way he, sp he talks, but the things that are on the tape were very, very detrimental, and the things uh, I didn't expect to hear. But the worst part was just the dishonesty, the dishonesty toward members, and then the dishonesty toward the state of Texas uh, with the denials and not telling the truth. That's what hit me the most. Governor Abbott released a statement after the announcement praising Bonin for his role in conservative priorities like the Born Alive Act, mm -hmm. cutting property taxes and putting Prop 4 on the ballot uh, to give voters the chance to permanently ban a state income tax. What is the recording, what it is about the recording that you see as overshadowing his accomplishments? Well, it has nothing to do with accomplishments. Uh, this, the whole reason for the need to resign and to have new leadership is honesty, integrity, and that's, that's the overriding thing. Uh, did we have a good session? I believe it was a Republican light session, um, but I believe that Republican values and principles are what the most of the people in the state of Texas are wanting, and that's what needs to be put forth. And uh, I believe that we did a, an okay job with that this session. Uh, but I think we could do a much better job with that, with the leadership of our governor, uh, lieutenant governor, and uh, new leadership in the House. Yeah, who needs to be the next speaker? Well, right now, the next speaker needs to be somebody with honesty. 
I mean, honesty is the word that keeps coming out. Uh, that is the biggest part of this whole situation is uh, people expect honesty from their leaders. And with all the corruption going on in the United States right now and the federal government and so forth, uh, we're sick and tired of scandals. And so we just want to need a speaker more conservative, putting forth Republican values. You got to remember, uh, every state official is Republican. Uh, we control the House and the Senate. We should be putting forth Republican Party platform issues, and we need a speaker that's going to put those issues forward. And that's what the people, the majority of the people in the state of Texas, want. I'm putting you on the spot. Yes. What name at the top is of your list? Well, I don't have a name at the top. You know, there. That's the point. I mean, it'd be great to have a name. Uh, this came up so quickly. So uh, we are, again, that's what, in the meeting, uh, on the uh, caucus meeting on Friday, uh, we knew what we wanted to accomplish. We wanted to communicate and uh, cooperate with each other and get a plan forward. Uh, we never didn't think it was going to come this quickly on, um, well, we didn't get a resignation, which I believe after that statement yesterday uh, by the speaker team, there is no doubt that there's, um, been no um, uh, true repentance um, or remorse uh, in what was done. Representative, thank you for being with us. You're welcome. Thank you too, Josh. Bonin's fall from grace comes at a crucial time in Texas politics. He's the one who you could bring into a fundraiser and, and attract, uh, you know, big money donors and things like that. Um, now that person's not there. We turn to our panel for an in-depth look at how the fallout could affect the battle for the Texas House in 2020 and the search for ways to improve elections in Texas. How an idea from another state could cut the influence of big money on politics. He started the year as one of the most powerful people in Texas government, but scandal stripped that power away. House Speaker Dennis Bonin will not face criminal charges, but he also will not seek re-election. The question now is, what's next? For insight, we go to our roundtable. Matthew Watkins is the politics editor for the Texas Tribune, and James Berrigan covers state government for the Dallas Morning News. Welcome to both of you. Hey, Josh. <laughs> so, James, you were at the Republican House caucus meeting last week where Bonin spoke to the members. Was this a done deal or did he have a chance to save his job when he went into that meeting? Uh, it's, it's hard to say. I think, th I think, the, I think Speaker Bonin definitely thought that he could explain to the members his, his perspective. And I think he'd done so in the past, tried to really highlight the part of the meeting that was about keeping a Republican majority in the House, kind of fending off uh, primary, primary challengers to Republicans. Um, so I think he, he definitely went in there thinking that he had a shot at turning this around, at, at surviving this sort of uh, uh, scandal that was plaguing him. But I think as the meeting kept going, it was only supposed to last 45 minutes and then it dragged on to two hours, to one hour, two hours, three hours, eventually four hours. I think the more it dragged on, the more that showed discontent within the caucus. Um, and obviously that they, they came out with a, a statement condemning him, but not sort of censoring him or calling for his resignation. But that seemed to snowball into the effects that we saw on Monday and Tuesday, uh, where, where he finally made the decision to not seek re-election after being pressured. So we're not in session right now with the legislature. Why does this even matter? Well, it matters because Bonin, a couple of reasons. It matters because there's a lot of work that gets done in the interim around the budget. You know, uh, in 2021, there'll be redistricting. Um, a lot of the work of the House gets done before the lawmakers come back together. Um, but perhaps more immediately, it also matters for the 2020 elections. Uh, Democrats are hoping they can flip the House this time around. Republicans need to kind of stick together to defend their seats. Um, Dennis Bonin was kind of the leader of the House. He's the one who you could bring into a fundraiser and, and attract uh, you know, big money donors and things like that. Um, now that person's not there, we probably, you know, there's a good chance we won't know who the next speaker will be for a long time. And so there's kind of a, a, a leaderless situation in the House and, and that could have effects on the election. 
Now we had Representative Biederman on earlier and I asked him, you know, who he thought should be the next speaker. He didn't have a straight answer, but he did say, you know, there is the real need for unification because there's a lot of distrust among the party right now. Who do you think could fill that role? You know, I think that there's probably 149 members who, who think they could fill that role right <laughs> now. Um, you know, I think you're, you're right. A lot of times when a scandal like this happens, people kind of look for the opposite of the past leader. So, you know, I'll, I'll be interested to see whether uh, some of the lawmakers are looking for kind of a calm presence, uh, kind of a humble presence in, in the House. But, you know, there are definitely multiple candidates who, you know, you can already kind of get the sense that they, uh, they've kind of got their eye on this position. Who do you think? Well, two things to highlight, just going back to the point about the elections. I mean, they are without a captain. I think you're, and you guys in your story said that he was with the, the Republicans are without a quarterback and the coach, right? <laughs> they pulled like the important pieces off the field. He's got a three million dollar pack that he had set up to help uh, House Republicans. What happens with that money? Can people take money from him? Does that look bad? These are all conversations that are going to have to be had in the next year or so. Going to who's going to be the speaker next session, I think we've got to pump the brakes a little bit and wait for those elections to actually happen because the Democrats are mounting a serious challenge to take over the House. And so if they are able to gain more seats or even in what was four years ago unthinkable take over the Texas House, then you're going to have a different dynamic shaping up that's going to have much more Democratic influence and then uh, and then, uh, you know, a whole bunch of different names comes up yeah. for the speaker's race. Yeah, it's interesting. There's almost kind of two parallel speaker races that could happen right. at the same time. One if the Democrats win the House and one if the Republicans do. James, Matt, thanks for being with us. Thank, Thank you. you. A Texan caught up in the impeachment inquiry could face questions from Congress. Why Rick Perry says he won't be answering them anytime soon. Renewing democracy in Texas. We'll look closer at ideas to help bring more voters to the polls and bring new candidates to your ballot. Early voting is underway in Texas, but there's a big change this year. Lawmakers passed a bill during the last session that bans mobile polling locations. In past elections, officials used mobile locations to help reach voters in rural areas and in places like retirement homes. Supporters of the bill said it keeps authorities from making it easier for some people to vote compared to others. Overwhelming obstacles to voting was a key issue in a panel I hosted this week at the University of Texas. The Renewing Democracy panel included a screening of Democracy Rebellion, a documentary scheduled to debut on PBS in January. It looked at solutions to help bring more voters to the polls and bring new candidates to the ballot. Part of the discussion focused on how public financing of elections in Connecticut is leading to diversity in that state house. I asked a state senator from Connecticut if an idea like that could work here. Could something work in a state like Texas where the government is even bigger? I think, I think this kind of program could work anywhere. I think what would have to happen, is, first I think it's not an instantaneous thing, I think what would have to happen is there would have to be a story told about why this is valuable to the people. And not just the way that we normally tell a story where it's like, uh, this would make the elections clean. I don't know what value it has to me. I think people have to recognize that it allows entrance into uh, our political system in a way that other systems do not. What barriers do you see to this working in other places? What challenges have you guys faced beyond kind of those funding concerns? I think the biggest barrier is that the people who are already in the system don't want to be able to be challenged. Uh, that's still, that is still true today uh, in Connecticut. There are people still today, as Karen Hobart Flynn suggested, uh, that are out smiling and saying what a great system it is, but behind the scenes they're trying to kill this system. Because if we go backwards, you have incumbency protection. Uh, and so I think no matter where you go, whether it's a red state, a blue state, or a purple state, people who are in power are going to try to maintain that power. And so they do not want a system like this because this makes every single one of us vulnerable. And you have to spend the time in your district. You have to talk to people who you otherwise don't have to talk to. Uh, big money can't do anything. Lobbyists are useless. Next, let's turn to Travis County Clerk Dana de Beauvoir. Thousands of Texans' votes were thrown out in recent elections after they showed up to vote at the wrong polling place on election day, and many other potential voters have shown up at the wrong location and just not voted. 
As some experts predict the 2020 presidential election could draw people to the polls like never before, some county election officials have been working to move past precinct-based voting and instead open every polling place to voters regardless of where they live. How is that working? That approach is called vote centers. Um, and we have our own history with vote centers right here in Travis County. Uh, following the 2010 census, Travis County was just carved up so badly. Uh, we ended up going to a vote center program in 2011 for the very reason that had I left us in a position of using precinct-based polling, thousands and thousands of voters in 2011 would have lost their right to vote. And what I mean by that is they would have shown up at their uh, precinct polling place thinking that they were in the right place. Uh, and depending on what time of day they showed up, they may or may not have had the time, the opportunity to go back to the gerrymandered place where they were supposed to show up and cast a vote given uh, you know, child and work obligations and traffic uh, in Travis County, they might not have made it back over to what was their new, now correct polling place. The best way to counter a gerrymandered district like the multiple gerrymandered districts that Travis County was faced with in 2011 is to move to uh, a vote center um, kind of approach. Next, I want to move on to Anthony Gutierrez with Common Cause Texas. In 2021, the state legislature will begin working to redraw voter maps and the redistricting process, we all know it, which will help decide who represents you in government for the next decade. But for most of the last decade, Democratic lawmakers, civil rights advocates, and other groups have been fighting the state's maps after a string of legal challenges, arguing that tactics taken by the Republican majority put voters of color at a disadvantage. Is a repeat predicted this time around? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, that's, that's probably gonna happen. Um, so the, 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 the system we have right now is just absurd. When you said the better part of the last decade, like it was literally up until like a few months ago that, that litigation like finally got wrapped up. You know, this once a decade thing that we're supposed to do took the whole decade uh, to fix the maps. And during that time, you know, there's legislative sessions going on. There's policy decisions being made by people that were elected under illegal maps. You know, it's not like we're gonna go backwards and fix those policy things. But, you know, the important thing here is, well, there's lots of important things, but one of the sort of big macro things is that this is not a new thing that's happening this decade. It happened the prior decade and the one before that. <coughs> like, the problem here is partly the current people that are in power, but it's also that we're letting the people draw the maps who are then running under those maps. Um, there are a lot of different reforms we could try to adopt to fix uh, the process, but you know that's that's one of the biggest problems. Is that, like, do we expect them to all again try to uh, draw maps that are going to maximize their own power? Like, well, of course they are. That's just kind of the nature of how power works, right? State lawmakers are starting to get input on plans for redistricting in Texas. The Senate Select Committee on Redistricting will hold its first hearing Tuesday at the state capitol. They're only hearing invited speakers, no public testimony. We've told you how the House Redistricting Committee has been holding hearings around Texas. Their next one is Monday, November 4th in Corpus Christi. The committee will hear public testimony at that meeting. A Texan talks about plans to leave his role at the White House. The three things that I wanted to get done, got them done, and uh, it's time for me to go. Rick Perry's resignation comes amid the growing impeachment inquiry. Why he says he won't answer questions right now about his role in the controversy. Energy Secretary Rick Perry is leaving the Trump administration at the end of the year. His resignation comes amid the impeachment inquiry in Congress. There are questions about his role in the controversy, but Perry told reporters he won't be answering questions from Congress anytime soon. You could probably pick up the Wall Street Journal and get a, uh, a very good preview of what they're going to hear from me. But the fact is, I'm not going to participate. 
The White House has advised us not to participate. My general counsel has told me not to participate in what they consider to be an unprecedented effort to try to uh, use an inquiry in an uh, unlawful way. Perry has drawn scrutiny for his role in the controversy, but the former Texas governor says the impeachment inquiry has nothing to do with his departure. Perry spoke with Washington correspondent Anna Wernicke to talk about why he's leaving and what's next. There's never a good time uh, to leave. Energy Secretary Rick Perry says he's hanging up his hat and heading home to Texas. The three things that I wanted to get done, got them done, and uh, it's time for me to go. The former governor of Texas is one of the longest serving members of President Trump's cabinet after leading the Department of Energy for nearly three years. I helped the president do what I told him I'd do when he asked me to come on board. He's done a phenomenal job. President Trump praised Perry at a rally in Dallas last week, reassuring the audience that there's no bad blood between the two former political rivals. I want to thank you, Rick. What a job you've done. Earlier this month, the president blamed Perry for the midsummer phone call with the Ukrainian president that provoked the House Democrats' current impeachment inquiry. But Perry says his decision to leave came long before the comments. For eight or nine months, I, I've been looking for the proper off-ramp so that I could go back home. And he says he's looking forward to retirement in Round Top, Texas. I get to go see my wife, my dogs, and my friends in Texas. And says he's leaving the department in good hands. We got a great uh, replacement and, and uh, Dan Bruette that's coming on board. Uh, the Department of Energy is going to be continually uh, run in a very efficient way. For State of Texas in Washington, I'm Anna Warnicke. Perry says his last day in Washington will be December 1st. He told us he doesn't have any big plans. Perry said at 69 years old, he's ready to relax and spend time with his family. Thank you again for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. We'll be back next week to bring you an in-depth look at Texas politics.